the main points of the chapter that we cover. Now, before each exam, I also will provide you with a more detailed study guide. And um, that study guide, I should try to get out to you probably, probably, if you have a test on a Tuesday, I'll try to get it out like maybe five days in advance or so, so that you can have some time to work on the study guide. Sometimes people like to write their answers beside uh, what I write on the study guide. But one, one thing, I, I forgot to mention this when I was giving you tips, tips for success in the class. One thing I really want to caution you about, people again, a lot of times want to make this class about memorization, okay? There's really not a need necessarily for memorization of every detail. What you need to do is you need to <laughs> learn the vocabulary and understand what that vocabulary means in the process. I once had this student who um, did a really nice job. She had a study guide from me and, and she wrote her answers beside each point and they were really nice. She took them out from the notes and everything. And but the problem was she memorized the statements that she wrote without understanding it. So for example, we're gonna talk about um, something called, uh, well, we're gonna talk about osmosis, which is movement of water across the membrane. And in that discussion, we're gonna be talking about things that are osmotically active, okay? So osmotically active has a meaning, okay? But there's, there's a definition but, and she knew the definition, but unfortunately, when it, she memorized it, when she saw a question about that osmotically active term on the test, and it wasn't worded exactly as she memorized it, she didn't recognize what I was asking her because she didn't understand what osmotically active meant. She just memorized some words that didn't mean anything, and she didn't think about it in terms of the process and, and what that meant. So again, that's something else I really want to caution you guys about as you're trying to study and prepare and learn for your exams, okay? That's, that's something that I, I definitely, you know, I will see this again and again throughout the times that I teach. So try as you, Approach your study and try, try to, um, to not do that. Okay, so chapter one, we're going to talk, of course, about physiology. What is it? And then we're going to talk about the scientific method. Why we talk about the scientific method? This is basically the way by which all of what we understand about physiology, that information has been obtained. So we're going to talk about that briefly and what's a good research study. And this is actually going to be important um, to review this because people don't realize it, but when you graduate from your program, your learning doesn't stop, you know that. When you go to your job, you're going to, if you're doing things the correct way, you may have to take continuing education courses. Um, one thing that's really great that people do is they read research, maybe an article or two a month, to see, okay, does this treatment protocol work for this patient? Whether you're a nurse, PTA, OTA, Insurance only covers so much, guys, and you've got to have objectified, basically objective evidence to prove things. So that's why we're going to review that. We're going to talk about homeostasis, and then we'll talk about how humans are organized, which I know we talked about in anatomy, so that will be a review. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the tissues, which is nice for those of you who are in the lab. Today we're going to be looking at epithelial tissues, so to review that, I think uh, we'll make the lab time go a little faster and, and I think will help you to kind of refresh your memory from anatomy about these different tissues, where you find them, what they do, and so forth. Okay, so first of all, physiology. By definition, it's the study of how things in the body work. And it is a very delicate <coughs> balance, bless you, and I hope that in the course of this class, if you get nothing else out of it, <laughs> If you can just, I guess, gain an appreciation for how delicate we are. So many things go on inside of us that we don't see. We take it for granted because stuff just works right. It's amazing 
when we look at some of the details of what we're going to be talking about, that more things do not go wrong. I mean, it's true. And I hope that in the course of this class, as we talk about physiology and some of these processes and homeostasis, I want you to gain an appreciation for how delicate and precious life is and how delicate and precious our bodies are and how strong it is and how just amazing it is in general. Pathophysiology, of course, when you see the word patho, pathos, you're thinking of disease. So this is what happens when the physiology doesn't work correctly and disease results. Um, so for example, when you know mitosis, which is the process by which our cells divide um, normally, uh, when for some reason there is a, an issue with maintaining uh, the, the balance of how many cells divide, we can end up with cancer. Uh, so that's an example of pathophysiology. Okay, so questions about that so far? All right, so scientific method. Okay, who was in Pennsylvania Junior Academy of Science when you were in high school? Yes, one, that's it. Did you go, did you go to Slippery Rock to do yeah. your freezing? I might have judged you. <laughs> what, was your, what was your project then? Um, it was how um, music affects like free throw percentage. I swear I remember something. Which category were you in? Um, probably Psychology or something? I'm not, I don't remember. Yeah. I remember something about music therapy. I don't know. That would be funny. Yeah, that was really funny. But no, I, I like that. I, I used to go to like Slippery Rock Middle School and they had a teacher there who like tried to get every all the kids ready and they do like science projects and stuff and I'd go and give them critiques. And um, then I would go to the PGA. I always love to do like seventh and eighth grade because seventh and eighth graders are so like excited about stuff, <laughs> you know, like they, they haven't been tainted by, oh, biology. Why do I have to do this? Chemistry, oh no, physics, no. They just, they like all of it. So anyhow, what are the steps in scientific method? First of all, you look around and you notice a discrepancy in something and you want to know why that is. So you ask the question from something you see. And my example I always say is uh, if you see somebody who is the same age as you and they have beautiful skin and you have pimples, okay, you think to yourself, why? Why is that? So then you form a hypothesis. So what's a hypothesis? Everybody knows those two words. Yes, educated guess, right, like Wheel of Fortune in a way. So yeah, it's an educated guess um, as to why you're seeing this discrepancy, this observation. So essentially, a hypothesis or a visit problem, you could say, um, well, okay, <clears throat> some individuals have less pimples than others because they wash their face, you can be specific, twice a day. Um, okay, so then from that hypothesis, your educated guess, you conduct an analyze experiments that will test this hypothesis. Now, <coughs> experimental design is very important that it be done properly. What makes a good experimental design? Who can tell me? I mean, you could cheat and look on the next slide, but I mean, there, are, I mean, some things, just if you think logically, if I have two people in a study, you think that's going to be a pretty strong study? No. You want to have a lot, a lot of people. You want to have as many people as possible. The more people you can have in a study, the better. Because we know that human variation is vast, right? We're not all little mice in a lab bred to be genetically the same. We have anomalies, right? That's why they have these, you know, doctors have to enter side effects to medicines, right? As people take medicines, if they come in and there's a new side effect, they enter into a database. And that's why they have these long lists of side effects. Um, but everybody is, is a little bit different. What else makes a good research study? We have a lot of people in it. What else? Having a control. 
Yeah, have them control, right. So you wanna, generally you wanna have a couple of groups. You wanna have a control group and you wanna have an experimental group. The experimental group is going to receive the treatment that you're testing, okay? So for example, my control group would be people who, like me, wash their face once a day. The experimental group is gonna be people who wash their face twice a day, as my hypothesis suggests, right? So, okay, so so that that is that is a, a better way to, to do an experiment. Um, and, and and what what further could we do to make that experimental and control group study even stronger? Well, yeah, we're going to want to use statistics, sure, once we get our data. But also, if we randomly assign those people, right, if we randomly assign the people into the experimental and control group. And what's even better is the person, the researcher who's collecting this data, how many pimples does this person have after week one? How many pimples does this person have after week one? And they're counting up the pimples. If the experimenter is blinded as to which group he's even looking at, or she, does that make sense? So what makes it strong, having a large sample size, having um, experimental and control group, subjects are randomly assigned, and if the experimenter who's collecting the data is blinded. And if the, if, the, if the people who are in the experimental and control group, if they're blinded as well, they call it a double blind study. Um, this is where uh, people just have no idea what's really going on, so there's no bias. There's no bias in the experiment. So, okay. So, yeah, you, you have to have some type of objective data, which means you have to have something numerical that you can count. Even, like, if you've ever looked at studies for psychology, or sometimes they'll have surveys they give to people, right? Now, in these surveys, they have usually a number value assigned to a particular selection. So, like, um, uh, how did you feel after the treatment? Happy, extremely happy, not changed at all, right? And you have like a number assigned to each of those. So this way you can statistically analyze those responses. So statistical analysis is very important. Why? Because, okay, maybe after a month we see that our experimental group that washed twice a week had, I don't know, on average, 20 zits, okay? And the other group that washed once, one time a day had 40. Okay, that might seem like there was a significant difference there, but we need to be sure. And that's what statistical tests do for us. So those of you in PT, I know for sure, will have to look at research articles. And these are some of the questions that I ask you to define in these research articles. So let's just review again. So we first have to find a discrepancy that we see. We make an observation and ask a question about it. Again, why this person has more zits than the other, then form a testable hypothesis. So this person has more pimples because they wash one time a day, the other group, the other person washes twice a day. Okay, then we conduct and analyze uh, our experiments. So a good experimental study, large sample size, experimental and control groups, subjects randomly assigned. And what makes it really strong is if it's a double blind study where the researcher doesn't, who's collecting the data doesn't know which group the people are in and the people who are in these groups don't know which group they're in. So that makes a really good study. Eliminates a lot of bias. Then we have objective data, in this case the number of pimples, and we can statistically analyze them through different types of tests. From there we look to see if we have a significant difference, a statistically significant difference between experimental and control group. And then we decide if we're gonna accept or reject our hypothesis. If we accept the hypothesis, does that mean that it's gonna be a theory? No. A hypothesis, in order to become a theory, has to be tested and retested and retested and withstand the test of time, essentially. Different people have to test the same idea. This experiment could have been a fluke. 
You would want to run many trials of this, even as a researcher yourself, test it in different ways. There's always something you can do differently. Um, and over time, it does become a theory. So for example, we don't have many theories in science, but one theory that we have is Einstein's theory of relativity. A theory is still under exceptional scrutiny. And Einstein's theory of relativity has been challenged. Challenged by the string theory, quantum mechanics, okay? This idea of parallel universe and so forth and all. So theories, if they can, again, withstand the test of time, will become a law. What's an example of a law? Who knows of a law? There aren't a lot of laws, but there are some. Hmm? I gotta come close. Murphy's law. Murphy's law. That's a good one. I like that. Isn't that the one where it's like if something's gonna go wrong, it's always gonna go wrong? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> now that, but you know that is true. That's been tested time and again. Scientifically, though, we have we do have some laws. Um, one is the first law of thermodynamics, which we'll talk about, saying that matter, right, or energy, I'm sorry, can't be created or destroyed, but it can be, it can be transformed into different forms. So you have sunlight energy. The plant can take it through photosynthesis, make glucose energy. We can eat the plant, and we can make ATP energy. So that's a law that we have. But there, again, there aren't a whole lot of laws. But yeah, so hypothesis, tested, retested, 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 then can become a theory. Theories can be challenged, and if, again, they withstand the test of time, they can become a law. Okay, so any questions about that? All right, so this I just put on here because this is a very great example, historical example um, of, of a, a very good hypothesis. It was a heck of an educated guess. It turned out he was right. You know, this is Gregor Mendel, the monk, who um, gave us what we know about modern genetics today. He was the, basically, he was the basis his work was the basis for what we understand about genes. Before him, people thought all kinds of interesting things. Some people thought that inside a sperm cell was the baby, and I mean, the whole thing. And, you know, but nobody really thought, well, why does the baby sometimes not look just like the father? I mean, you know, nobody. So Gregor Mendel thought about that, and, you know, he realized there had to be something else. They also had some ideas that there was this, this whole thing about spontaneous generation. If you had a piece of bread in a trash can, and a couple days later you had had um, had uh, had like maggots there or something like that. They would think that the maggots would come from the bread, like just generate from the bread, as opposed to there being flies that laid eggs and so forth and so on. Like I said, people were very confused back then, but Gregor Mendel really helped us out. Um, and his hypothesis was that alternative versions of genes account for variations in inherited characteristics. For each character trait, height, color, texture, and he was talking about pea pods and pea plants at that time, um, an organism inherits two genes, one from each parent. Um, whether it be plants or humans or whatever. If the two genes or alleles differ, then one of them, the dominant one, is fully expressed. The other, the recessive one, has no noticeable effect. So from this, and again, this was very fundamental. I mean, he was looking at short versus tall pea plants, and definitely the tall gene was, was the dominant and the recessive was the short one. But from this, we also learned about things like codominance, like blood typing, for example. People can have A blood type, they can have B blood type, they can have a B blood type. Why can they have that? Because you can get an A gene from your mom, a B gene from your dad, both are codominant. They're both expressed on the surface of your red blood cell. So he gave us the foundation for that. And that's why, again, understanding research, understanding what's a good study, uh, can really help us to understand more about physiology and, 
and, and, and things. So it's very important. Okay, so using the scientific method to, to develop new drugs, if a new drug is suggested, its effectiveness and toxicity first is tested in tissue culture, um, which is considered, I guess, the most humane way. They sometimes will test mammals like rats and mice because they are mammals and so physiologically their systems are similar to human systems and they may process drugs in a similar way. Tissue culture is a process by which we take some cells and we end up putting those cells into um, a particular, we call it a med media, which is like a, a broth or it could be a gel or something. But usually it's a broth and it has a lot of nutrients in it and the cells will divide and you can make this tissue and then you can introduce the drug and see if that kills the cells. And if it does, you know it's probably not gonna work for humans. So if the preliminary trials are okay, we go into phase one clinical trials where the toxicity and metabolism is tested in healthy humans and healthy human volunteers. Okay, so that's where you see these flyers up sometimes in hospitals and research labs looking for volunteers. And then you always have that joke about how a guy grows breasts or something like that, you know, if he's doing these drugs. But seriously, sometimes they pay pretty well. I never did any of these, but I know when I was working in the research lab outside, when I got out of college, um, I remember I did volunteer for something, not drug trials, but one time I was a control for this vestibular study and they had put this like contact lens on my eye that had this wire coil and then they spun me around in the chair in the dark. That was very interesting. Yeah. What you what you do for fifty dollars, right? <laughs> like it's amazing. But no, really, you 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 could make some a little extra cash here and there off of that. It was it was kind of. But I wouldn't participate in drug trials. I don't know. It was just too sketchy for me. But those usually pay a couple hundred dollars, depending upon how risky they are. The more money you get, the more risky they are. But anyway, if it clears in healthy human volunteers, then they go into phase two clinical trials where they test. The target population. So, if we're looking at a blood pressure medicine, they're going to test people who have high blood pressure, okay? But they wouldn't test somebody who has high blood pressure and kidney failure as a result of it or has congestive heart failure or something. Only high blood pressure. In phase three, that's when they're going to take the people who, who have, again, high blood pressure and the people who have other comorbidities. So they have other types of issues uh, that can be a problem. And then phase four, the drug is going to be tested. Once the patent wears out, once it's, it's finished, they check uh, in phase four clinical trials for other potential uses. So that's basically the way that it goes. So an example here, I guess, of the drug, since we're talking about blood pressure medicines, um, Okay, Viagra, interestingly, was a blood pressure medicine. Um, why? Because it's a dilator of blood vessels, okay? So people who had high blood pressure, one of the choices of drug was, was Viagra, which um, basically is uh, nitric oxide, and nitric oxide helps the blood vessels to dilate. Well, obviously the patent wore out, so they went ahead and retested it for use in erectile dysfunction. So then it was an erectile dysfunction. But that's also why you would see that the, one of the side effects is, you know, the blood pressure gets low, people can pass out, don't go in the hot tub, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so that's pretty much how the clinical trials go. Phase one, healthy people. Phase two, target population. Phase three, the population that has that condition plus has other comorbidities. And phase four, uh, once it's um, been used and the patent has uh, worn out, then the drug is tested for other uses. All right, so any questions about that section? All right, so let's see, homeostasis. Let's talk about that and then I think probably we'll take another break a little bit before, I think before, 11 or so, but maybe like in five minutes.
maybe like 20 minutes or so, we'll take another break. So that way you guys will be up and down. Are you too warm? Is it warm in here for you? It feels fine. It feels fine? Did you say, see, I can't. I heard the voice over here, but I wasn't sure. I feel really warm. I think it's the lights. Probably, and probably from where my laptop too. But I was gonna say there is an air conditioner in the back if you guys wanted to open that or open some of the windows if you are warm. Um, okay, so homeostasis, very important concept in physiology, as I said. We'll see it with every system we talk about. The definition of homeostasis is the body's ability to maintain relatively stable, constant internal environment despite an ever-changing outside environment. And it's appropriate that I start to get hot now because an example of homeostasis is temperature regulation, right? What's our core body temperature supposed to be? Ninety-eight point six degrees Fahrenheit, usually, okay? And why is that important? Well, in our core, we have our vital organs, so you want to make sure they're working properly. Our extremities might be able to get a little cold once in a while. It's not going to be uh, as, as earth shattering as long as it doesn't get too cold. But our core body temperature should be about 98.6 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And so when we have, okay, again, a set point right here, 98.6 degrees, if we become too warm, we start to perspire. And when we perspire, the sweat, being partly water will evaporate and that will help to release heat from um, from our bodies that will help to return us back to the set point but then maybe we'll get a little bit too cold so what do we do we shiver that contraction relaxation of those erector pili muscles is going to cause us to get a little bit warmer because with those contractions we're releasing heat and we get back to 98.6 and basically that's what happens you know if you run in a marathon, you get hot, you sweat. You're out in the cold, you know, you, you get very cold, you shiver, and, and then you return back. So you're constantly, despite whatever the outside world is doing to your body, whatever it's, it's putting you in, your body has that ability to maintain that set point, or at least fluctuate around it within a certain degree. That's what homeostasis is about. Another example is blood pH regulation, which we'll talk about in a second, but 7.35, 7.45 is blood pressure, that's the normal range. And if we go outside of that, it can be very damaging to our organs. So there are mechanisms, which we'll be talking about in the class, through the respiratory system, through the renal system, that will help to maintain that normal pH. Now, I'll give you guys a lay example as well. This is a common everyday example um, that you probably don't have to worry about too much right now in your house because the weather's nice, but temperature regulation in your home, okay? You have a thermostat, right, that will detect changes, and we have our thermostat set to a certain point. <coughs> if your temperature goes too far below or too much above, the thermostat can communicate with either your furnace or your air conditioner to get back to the set point, whatever it is. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more when we talk about what negative feedback loops are. Homeostasis is managed by something called negative feedback loops. So it's a loop, again, and it has three main parts. We have a stimulus, which is our deviation from the set point. We have a sensor which detects this deviation from the set point. And we have an integrating sensor which determines what we're gonna do with this information. And then finally, we have an effector which will cause an effect, which is the response. Okay, so let me give you again the thermostat example. We'll label the parts to this loop. So, Say you have your thermostat set to 67 degrees. Okay, so if you, if you uh, open a window on a winter day, then the temperature in your house is gonna drop. So the thermostat 
is going to detect this. So the stimulus is the dropping of the temperature, right? That's what's the, the deviation from our set point. We go from 67 to 66 degrees, okay? That's, that's our stimulus. The sensor will be our thermostat, which detects that change. Then from, from there, our thermostat is also going to, in this case, be our integrating center because it's going to figure what to do, figure out what to do with that deviation. So if we go from 67 to 66, what needs to happen? The furnace has to kick on to bring us back to our set point. So in this case, the thermostat is the sensor, it detects the change, but it's also the integrating center. Our effector, which produces the response or the effect, is the furnace. The furnace, when it kicks on, will bring us back to our set point. So it's a negative feedback loop because once we get back to our set point, our stimulus is shut off and we've gotten back to homeostasis again, our homeostatic range. There are more examples too that we'll talk about physiologically, but do you have any questions so far? Okay, because again, we will talk about this a little bit more. I'm gonna skip this idea of intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms right now. I will go back to these two slides. <clears throat> But let's look at a couple physiological examples of a negative feedback loop since we just talked about the parts to it and everything. All right, so <clears throat> these two flow charts are showing us <coughs> what happens uh, with blood sugar regulation. Okay, so in the blood we have sugar, uh, which is in the form of glucose. Okay, glucose is a, is a sugar. If we eat, our blood sugar goes up as you might guess. So usually our blood sugar levels should be between 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. If it goes too high, then we need a negative feedback loop to return us back to the level. If we have uh, the blood sugar dropping too low, we need a negative feedback loop to counteract that. Yes? What did you say? The, um, the, um, sugar. Oh, 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter, mg uh, slash dl, like lowercase dl. So it'd be, oops. I think it might, it might be on one of the slides, I'm not sure, mg per dl, milligrams per deciliter. So that's like, that's the weight per volume of blood. So milligrams is the weight, of the sugar, so that's how much you should have in weight per deciliter, which is the volume of blood. Okay, so if we eat, our blood sugar goes up. So the blood sugar going up is our deviation from the set point, right? So that is our what? A negative feedback loop, the parts of the negative feedback loop we just looked at, what part is that? The stimulus? Right, because it's a deviation from the set point. When the sugar goes up, okay, what detects this? In the pancreas, we have those special cells called the islets of Langerhans, which you may, I think, I teach it, I think you probably learned in anatomy. These little cells are responsible for producing insulin. And also, its antagonist, glucagon. Now insulin, for those of you who may be familiar with it because you know somebody with diabetes or you yourself has diabetes, insulin helps to do what to blood sugar levels? Lower, right. Glucagon will have the opposite effect. Glucagon helps to, to raise sugar levels, okay? Right now we're over here. <coughs> Excuse me. So insulin is going to be released from the pancreatic islet cells. Okay, in this example, the pancreatic islets, what, are, what part of the, the negative feedback loop are they? We said the increase in blood sugar was the stimulus. So what's the pancreatic islets? Where are they gonna be? The sensor, okay. And in this case, they're also gonna be the 
integrating center. This isn't always the case where you have the same sensor and integrating center, but in this example and the thermostat example, it was that way. So the pancreatic islet cells are the sensor and the integrating center, and they're going to figure out what to do with this information. The sugar levels have gone up. What do we need to do? Well, what we need to do is we need to release insulin because insulin will cause the cells like for example, skeletal muscle uh, or the liver, will take up the glucose molecules, okay? And that will help to drop the blood sugar. So insulin in this case and the cells are going to be our effector. They are going to generate the effect. What is the effect? Our blood sugar levels drop. When the sugar levels drop, we shut off the initial stimulus, we return back to homeostatic levels, and it shuts off. So that's a negative feedback loop. So once again, we eat, sugar goes up. What is that? Stimulus. stimulus. Pancreatic cells are the? Sensor and, and integrating center. Got it, sensor and integrating center. Insulin and the cells are going to produce the effect, so they are the? Factor. Effectors, and that's going to drop the blood sugar levels, that's our effect, and that shuts off the initial stimulus, which makes it a negative feedback loop. Okay, so you got that example. Now we'll do the opposite on the right side. We have a case here where we're fasting, and the blood sugar levels, of course, go down. What is that? Stimulus. Stimulus. Pancreatic islet cells are going to be the? Sensor. And integrating center. Right, center and integrating center. Sen sorry, sensor and integrating center. And then here, what we have is we've got an increase in glucagon. Glucagon is produced in greater abundance. Insulin levels drop. Uh, so the, the glucagon uh, is going to be an effector as well as the, uh, the liver. The liver, what glucagon does is it goes to the liver. We store glucose. Do you know what the molecule is called that we store? We store long, long chains of glucose in the liver uh, in molecules called this. Does anybody know? What, what is it? Glycogen? Glycogen? So what the glucagon does is it causes the liver to take up the glucose. And just like you're making a necklace of beads, the glucose molecules are added to a longer chain of glucose they bond and that that's called glycogen so essentially what glucagon does is it causes the liver to break those little bonds between the glucose molecules and the liver can then release the glucose into the bloodstream because it, it breaks off the glucose from the glycogen molecules so when that happens the blood sugar levels go up and that shuts off our, our initial stimulus. So you guys told me the drop in blood glucose is the stimulus, pancreatic islets are the sensor and integrating center. What was the effector? The glucagon and the cells of the liver, which will release glucose. And when we uh, increase the blood sugar, that's the effect that shuts off the initial stimulus. Do you have any questions? I got a much simpler example. And finally, in this case, finally, we have a different sensor and integrating center. So let's take a look at this one. This is blood pressure regulation. So when you're laying down, obviously, your blood pressure doesn't have to be as high. Because you don't have to, the body doesn't have to work against gravity to get the blood up to, to the brain, right? So you're laying down, you stand up, what happens? The blood pressure drops. That is your stimulus. We have a special type of receptor that is found conveniently in the aorta and the carotid arteries, which is nice because you gotta detect the pressure going up through the head. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, can you imagine what it would be? I mean, if your blood pressure, when people have orthostatic hypotension, it's very, very dangerous for them because they can pass out because they can't get the blood to the brain. These receptors are called Barrow receptors. Barrow, that, that prefix, uh, is in another 
word you may know. Does anybody know what I'm thinking of? Barrel. Barometer? Yeah, barometer. What do barometers do? Measure pressure, right? Yeah, they measure pressure. So that, that's why they're called baroreceptors. They're found in the aorta, they're found in the carotid arteries, and they are going to be the sensor. They will send the signal to the integrating center, which in this case is the medulla oblongata, like from Waterboy, that movie with Adam Sandler from a long time ago. The medulla, and from the medulla, um, the integrating center, a signal is sent to our heart muscle, which is our effector. What happens is the heart muscle is going to contract more quickly and that's going to help rise or raise our blood pressure, which shuts off the initial stimulus. So the heart muscle would be the effect or the effect would be a rise in blood pressure. So that's a little easier example, I think, because you have a different sensor integrating center effect or it's like all, all different. So once again, you lay down, you get up fast, your blood pressure drops. What's that? Stimulus. 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 Good. Um, this is detected by the baroreceptors, and that is the sensor. sensor. Integrating center is the medulla. medulla. Yes. And that sends a signal to the heart muscle, which is the Factor. Effector, which causes the heart muscle to beat faster, and that causes the blood pressure to go up, which is the effect, and that shuts off the initial stimulus, which is a negative feedback loop. All right, so any questions about negative feedback loops? Those three examples are the only three I have for you. So, <coughs> any, anything at all? Okay, sometimes it's a harder concept for people to understand, but if you understand it, you're good. I mean, again, we'll see this again and again. We'll be I'll try to bring it up whenever I can. Anytime you see that little negative sign with a circle around it in a process, that's a negative feedback loop, which there are thousands and thousands of them. In fact, most of the systems in our body and our bodies are maintained by negative feedback loops. About 99% of them are. And negative feedback loops are what maintains homeostasis. Okay, so that's important to remember that homeostasis is maintained by negative feedback loops because there are also something called positive feedback loops that we're going to talk about as well. So I skipped a couple slides. I went back to them. Um, in terms of negative feedback loops, there are two, two ways that homeostasis can be maintained, either intrinsically, which means that that homeostatic system is built into a particular organ or organ system that's being regulated. For example, inside the blood, um, we're gonna learn, in lab, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely learn about carbon dioxide transport. And carbon dioxide uh, can be converted to bicarbonate. And bicarbonate can act as a buffer, it can take up excess hydrogen. Okay, and again, we'll talk about what buffers are and, and all that kind of thing in chapter two. But the point is, is that this whole mechanism happens within the blood itself, which is within the blood vessel and flesh. And a blood vessel, if you think about it, is an organ. We, don't, we always think like the heart and all, but the blood vessel is an organ within the cardiovascular system, right? So intrinsic control means that that homeostatic mechanism is built in the organ. It's built into the organ that's being regulated. So blood buffering is an example of that. Extrinsic control comes from outside the, the organ. So in the example of body temperature, like I talked about, this is controlled by um, antagonistic effects of, sh of, of shivering and sweating. And essentially, um, why we say this is extrinsic, remember that you're maintaining the core body temperature, right? But you're not maintaining it within, say, the liver or the heart. You're maintaining it through the skin, right? Through shivering or through sweating. 
And so therefore, that internal body temperature is being extrinsically or externally regulated by the skin. Does that make sense? So remember, intrinsic means within. So blood buffering is an example of that because it happens right inside the blood vessel. Whereas extrinsic means from without or exit, right, out. And an example would be um, temperature regulation through the skin, maintaining the core body temperature. Okay? All right, we're almost ready for a break, guys. Um, extrinsic control, uh, again, another example here would be if a person was diabetic and we had to uh, regulate, we had to regulate externally. So if we had to do an insulin injection or something like that, um, that would be regulating the blood sugar levels from without. So that would also be an example of an extrinsic control mechanism. And, you know, even, even naturally, the pancreatic cells, those islet cells we just talked about, I mean, they produce those hormones, insulin and glucagon, to regulate the blood sugar levels. That's not regulated from within the blood vessel itself. Those hormones have to be made elsewhere and brought in.